So uh, it's good to be here. Um, this is my first flight in three years and four months. And I can't think of a nicer place to go than Vancouver. Well, maybe Paris, but um, th that's next month. Uh, but anyway, um, I want to tell you a little bit about a project I've been working on for a while and uh, see if uh, we can uh, uh, drum up some some additional interest in it. The project is called Flossbach, which is free Libre open source software. Uh, and uh, the idea is to build a Bach, a body of knowledge. And uh, when you think about all that's going on with open source these days, uh, and, and as it's grown since uh, you know, the early days, uh, the amount of knowledge that you have to pick up to be considered an expert in open source is really quite overwhelming. Uh, so I've, um, let me tell you just a little bit about myself. Let's see if I can make this work. Yay. Okay. So, oh, by the way, you know, the um, Linux Foundation sent me a template to use and it was a PowerPoint presentation. PowerPoint template. So I'm running Ubuntu and this is open document impress or Libra Libra office. So I figured as long as we're doing open source, right? May as well use the good stuff. All right. Well, this machine actually boots up running a different operating system as well. So, uh, but my, I left my, my Mac at home. So uh, this is my last month at Carnegie Mellon, Silicon Valley. Uh, I've been there 18 years uh, teaching things related to product management and software product strategy, and of course, open source software, which I first taught, I think, in 2006. Uh, so, uh, <clears throat> but my history around open source goes back a long way. Uh, when um, uh, early in my career, I, I had a stint in industry, so I kind of half and half between academia and industry. But um, early in my career, uh, we built some software uh, that used a BSD license because BSD was developed at, at University of California, Berkeley, and I had a lecturer's appointment there in addition to a faculty appointment at, at UC San Francisco. So we built some software and we said, okay, well, let's distribute it. And we put a BSD license on it. So this was in 1980. Nobody called it open source at the time, but of course it was. And so, um, so that's a lot of history. Uh, when I came back to academia uh, in 2005, I decided to go back and do some more work on, on open source, not to write code, uh, you know, that's a good thing to do, but the, uh, the project that I worked on was evaluation adoption and use of open source software. So the question then as now is, there's all this stuff out there. How do I find it? You go say, okay, I'm looking for a content management system. What do you get? I don't know, 1,100 or 1,400 of them. Now, if you're just some IT person or developer in a, in a company, and you say, well, I want to use a content management system. Well, you can go to the proprietary vendors and they'll send a salesperson, they'll do a demo and they'll do all this good stuff, right? Nothing against that. I ran a software company that sold proprietary software. Um, it had open source software in it, uh, but that's, that's a whole other story. Um, so how do you find in, in all these open source projects, how do you find something? Now, when we started this idea in 2005, there wasn't so much open source. And there was the two camps, right? The people who used proprietary software and said, no open source. And the people who said, you know, well, we're gonna use open source. And there wasn't much of a middle, right? These were two distinct sets. And so here are these people who said, well, you know, I'm evaluating software for a project. And what did they evaluate? The proprietary products. 
because of, you know, they didn't know about the others. So the project that we ran called OSS PAL, uh, well, it was originally called Business Readiness Rating, and then after some years it evolved and became OSS PAL. Uh, it, the idea was to help you find open source software that was, quote, business ready. In other words, it works, it's maintained, it's documented. There's a community, all the kinds of things that people expect to get uh, when they use a piece of software. And one of the things that uh, was an important observation in, in, their, in that space was that uh, you know, there's nobody to sell it to you. And there weren't a whole lot of commercial open source businesses at the time. Right? So you had to go out and do your own evaluation. And so even the idea that you could give people a short list of open source projects in a particular category was a valuable addition. And it's one of, that's one of the things we did with OSS PAL. Now, the idea of getting people to evaluate proprietary and open source software side by side, that was a different issue and, a, and one that has partly come to pass. It's not all there yet, but it's come you know, part of the way. So uh, that's uh, what OSS PAL was all about. And then I was on the board of the OSI for a few years. All right, so this brings us to Flossbach. And really, the, the idea of Flossbach is pretty simple, right? A body of knowledge. What do you have to know about this space? And we'll talk about some of the topics as we go. And the idea behind uh, Flossbach is you know, partly that idea of uh, finding things, but, but and there's another thing behind it, which is getting knowledgeable and being comfortable with the idea of using open source software. Now today, it's a whole lot easier because there are a lot of commercial open source businesses uh, and there are a lot of businesses that have derived from community open source projects. So uh, you know, most of the time you can get support for uh, the, the most widely used projects. But in order to bring open source software into your organization and use it properly, you need to know a lot of things. It's not just how to write code and, and do pull requests and you know, be a maintainer on a project and, and all these kinds of essential things, but you have to know something about licensing. Uh, you have to know, uh, you know a whole bunch of other topics. Uh, in the past uh, couple of years, we've seen a huge growth in interests like cybersecurity, uh, that you certainly have to be aware of. Uh, there's uh, all the work that's been done around SPDX and Software Bill of Materials and Open Chain. Uh, there, there are all those, those issues. Uh, so uh, it doesn't take very long before there's a whole lot of stuff that you need to be knowledgeable about for you to be able to uh, effectively not just find and, and uh, adopt open source, but to take the next step, which is to make it part of your organization and part of the way that you do business. If you're a company, the idea that you're comfortable with using it internally and with uh, uh, contributing, well, up as you go, first of all, putting it in products that you ship to customers uh, or even products that you host uh, in, in the cloud uh, having open source software in them, and then the idea of uh, contributing to open source, or as many companies have started to do, uh, is to you know, have your own uh, GitHub repositories. And uh, uh, you know, uh, if you've uh, heard any of the talks from Comcast, they were quite um, aggressive in terms of taking software that they were building uh, inside their uh, company and, and making it available. And uh, Nitya Ruff, whom some of you may know, uh, who, who uh, started that effort, gave a talk about how it took them 10 years to get there. So this, um, this idea of building up expertise in, uh, in your organization 
uh, has led to things like open source project offices, uh, which become the uh, central repository, if you will, for uh, a lot of uh, knowledge and administrative activities around open source. You know, who's using which version? I've got a big company with a bunch of different divisions, and I've got people here and there and there using open source software. Well, you know, who's using which version on which platform, and, is, and it's contained in which product? All those kinds of questions come up. Okay. All the questions about whether uh, people who work for the company uh, can contribute to open source projects outside of the ones that their company is working on. In some cases, we know that people are assigned to work on open source projects. But you know, people go home from work, and then they become hobbyists, and they work on something else. Uh, is that OK? So there are all these kinds of questions and policies that come up around open source. And it takes a while for an organization to uh, you know, build up its own culture and its knowledge uh, about, about open source. <clears throat> so if you're wanting to work in open source, or if you're wanting to teach people about it, or if you're wanting to write uh, a book about it, uh, you need to cover not just the, OK, how do I do a pull request, uh, or, or you know, how do I use Python and all the various projects that, uh, that are out there, the various tools, Scikit and the like. Um, it's you know, what do I have to know to really be able to go in there and uh, bring in open source? And you know, putting on my academic hat for a moment, some of our students would go out, and certainly in the early days of, of teaching open source, they would be the only one in their company who knew anything about open source. And so they immediately got put in charge of open source, um, which is really kind of a funny notion if you think about it for a moment. But you know, it's that knowledge that they build up about the technicalities of it and the business and legal issues of it and the organizational and community issues of it that constitutes a body of knowledge. So that's what really we went after. Uh, here's my word salad. <coughs> you can see it has mostly open source in there. But <coughs> so you know, question one is, well, what are the topics that we need to think about in creating a body of knowledge. <clears throat> and how do we organize it? Well, fortunately, we have some historic precedents to look at. Uh, there's the, uh, the one with which I'm the most familiar is the software engineering body of knowledge, which is now in its almost fourth edition. There's a draft of the fourth edition out for review. Um, you know, and I. I have some significant quibbles with uh, the content of, of uh, Swebuck, but it's gotten better. And of course, software engineering has grown very quickly as a discipline, too, as people have moved into mobile and, and people have ad adopted new kinds of architecture. So uh, you have new kinds of human interfaces, uh, and, and those are growing, right? I mean, you know, the uh, idea of speech input and output has been around a long time, but now it's you know, something that's expected in a lot of projects. So, so that body of knowledge is growing. Uh, long before Swebach was PMBOK, the project management body of knowledge. Okay, and you know, what you can do, okay, there are things called, there's a thing called the Project Management Institute. And you can become a member of that, and you can uh, study their material, and you can be certified. And to be certified, you basically have to know the things that are in the project management body of knowledge. Okay, so that's, that's the motivation. There's also something, something with, with which I'm connected, uh, is the uh, International Software Product Management Association. So what does the product manager do? What are the things the product manager is supposed to know in terms of creating roadmaps and uh, plans for projects and talking to users and you know, planning the marketing campaigns and all those things? So again, 
there's a certification program. So those, those kinds of things serve as the motiva motivation for uh, Flossbach. And of course, what it leads to, once you figure out what it is, is you can build courses, you can write textbooks. Your courses might be a short course on you know, three days on some particular aspect of open source, or it might be a more comprehensive thing you could think of as taking you know, a period of months, either in a, an academic setting or with any one of the online Coursera, Udemy, edX kinds of programs where somebody is going to uh, be able to learn and presumably get a certificate that says, okay, this person has taken this open source course. So, all right. So when we try to think about the topics that might go into a body of knowledge, you know, at a high level, we can uh, think about all these different things, right? What is open source? You know, this is there's an official definition, as I'm sure uh, most of you know, right? You can go to opensource.org/osd if you haven't seen it, uh, and um, uh, and there's a long history, uh, as I, as I mentioned, uh, you know, I shipped open source software a long time ago. The Free Software Foundation uh, came around in 1985, uh, the uh, Open Source Initiative in 1998, and lots of other things going on before and after. And uh, as, um, as you may have seen, this year is the 25th anniversary of the Open Source Initiative. And so they've uh, been going around the world giving various talks and presentations uh, to uh, try to uh, build up, uh, increase awareness and usage. So, um, you know, these other topics, contrasting open source with proprietary software uh, and uh, licensing issues, uh, development processes. We've all, if we come from a technical background, uh, learned software development practices, many of them are individual software development practices rather than team practices. Uh, so what are the development processes and how are they different in an open source project than they are in a uh, proprietary project? Now the pandemic has changed that because when we think about how software was developed in companies five years ago, you know, they put up a whiteboard, everybody came in, then nine o'clock in the morning, you had a stand-up meeting and talked about, okay, this is, a, this is a showstopper here, we gotta fix this, how are you doing? I'm ahead of schedule, that kind of, you know, 15 minutes. Okay, what happened? Everybody scattered, right? So five years ago, we thought, okay, having a stand-up meeting, everybody there was the thing to do. Very quickly, it evolved. Right, so uh, that, that now, what is the development process? How do you keep track of people? How do you meet? Are there things that are different? And of course there are, right? Because in proprietary projects, typically people have an assignment and they're working on something and they deliver it and integrate it and do the build. In an open source project, many of the contributors aren't core maintainers of the project, right? So. They write some code, they do a pull request, then somebody reviews it and says, nah, this can't go in, or you gotta make this change, right? So uh, a whole bunch of changes come about as a result of uh, the process of open source. And uh, another thing that we always know about open source projects is and how it differs from proprietary kind of when you all work for the same company you see each other every day you meet at the you know you used to meet at the coffee stand um, but there's this idea of a certain degree of camaraderie okay we're all working for this we're going to make our stock valuable we're going to get our bonus well that implied a set of shared goals 
But on open source projects, you don't necessarily have that. Right? You have people who've come from a bunch of different places, some voluntarily, some because they're assigned to it, uh, and they might be anywhere in the world. So that affects processes because there's a lot of culture involved in development processes, even though we like to think that there isn't. Uh, so that's a topic where you know, it's, it's as much sociology as technology, but it's an area that needs to be addressed in a body of knowledge. Uh, so commercial uses, there are a lot of different ways that organizations uh, are able to uh, make money from uh, their project. Some of the early ones, of course, included training. But I remember going to a conference, and the way they made money was they sold the t-shirts and the mugs. Fine. You know, I'll pay $10 for the mug. Uh, that's at least one way of contributing. And there are, of course, other things like Patreon and you know, uh, ways to ways to contribute. But there are a lot of other differences between commercial tools and uh, community tools and foundation-based tools. And then there are the ones that are dual, right? So you have uh, Drupal, it's a community project with thousands of contributors of modules and themes and so on. But then uh, the founders of Drupal started Acquia, which is a commercial venture. Right, to provide commercial support and features. So, so there are a lot of places that we can look at and say, OK, what are the differences between commercial and uh, non-commercial? What are the kinds of applications? Um, it's a big list. You know, a lot of what happened in open source, certainly in the early days, was infrastructure. Right? Linux being a good example of that, and the Apache HTTP browser infrastructure. On top of that, you have development tools, right? Eclipse being uh, a widely used one, but, but there are hundreds of others. So a lot of those really went into place, right? but there are applications that use, that build on that infrastructure. Historically, what the situation was that uh, the, the infrastructure and the development tools have become increasingly open source. I mean, even Microsoft with Visual Studio Code is part of that, right? So lots and lots of open source. And the applications have tended not to be. They've tended to be proprietary. And that's especially true in mobile. When you look at the number of open source apps on mobile devices, it's sad. It's a very small number. Almost everything is proprietary. So when you look at these two things together, um, you see that there's uh, this whole collection of applications. And uh, what we discovered actually long ago with uh, the, the earlier project was that um, IDC, which is a big consulting firm uh, that caters to large enterprise clients, uh, they build a taxonomy of software. Uh, it's a, an annually updated book. And they have like 80 some odd categories. And only a handful of them are development tools and infrastructure. Most of them are uh, application domains for finance and for uh, insurance and for uh, construction and, and the like. And that area has not seen a lot of open source software. That tends to be proprietary. So understanding what applications are out there and what the opportunities are. Uh, I was on uh, email this morning with uh, uh, somebody who was uh, about to do uh, a video production and, and editing. And I said, do you know about OBS and Shotcut, which are really nice open source video uh, production and, and editing tools? And she said, no, I'll go check them out, because she was using you know, 
proprietary stuff. Uh, so all kinds of applications uh, people want to know about. Uh, open source communities. There's been a lot done around community management. And maybe many of you have seen Jono Bacon's books uh, that um, uh, The Art of Community with two editions and his uh, later work called Dealing with Disrespect. Uh, so there's a lot of interest in open source communities and summarizing that. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, there's a lot of recent work around supply chains and build materials and, of course, security, uh, as we heard this morning in the keynotes and, and have had numerous talks. So, you know, if we start to think about those topics, think there to yourself, well, how many of those do I feel knowledgeable about to the extent that I could write, you know, let's say, a couple thousand words on any of them? And you won't find a lot of people who can cover more than you know, three or four of them. Okay? Because you very quickly get into areas of expertise. Right? This is not a survey course. It's a bunch of survey, it's a bunch of in-depth depth courses that would come together. So you know, getting somebody who, who's really knowledgeable about supply chains and bill of materials, that's probably somebody who's been involved with Open Chain or SPDX or uh, any of the other related projects uh, because they kind of know the, the next level, whereas a lot of the rest of us who don't work in that space can kind of give you the 30-second overview uh, and then, you know, that's it. So putting together that kind of body of knowledge for somebody who really wants to develop the uh, expertise around these different areas is really the challenge that we uh, face in trying to build a body of knowledge. So we tried creating um, Flossbach and, you know, we got started, but one of the problems that we have is um, student labor. Now, nothing against students. I was once one. Um, and, but at the same time, they come and they go. And while they're there, they're taking other classes, and they're looking for a job, and they're socializing, and uh, looking for internships. And so there aren't a whole lot of hours in the day that they have to uh, participate in any project. Even if you pay them as a research assistant, you know, it's 10 hours a week may maybe. And of course, they don't have the knowledge themselves. So uh, that presented a challenge. So what, what occurred to me is that, you know, we really need to uh, run this like an open source project and try to get contributors and try to um, hear from uh, experienced professionals to get them to to join in. Uh, so, so one of my uh, main reasons for, for being here, apart from my uh, love of Vancouver, uh, is the, um, the effort to build a core team of people who want to see this this idea through and to either take ownership of some particular category uh, you know, or to uh, be a willing contributor to a category with somebody else leading it. But building this core team uh, would involve, I think, contributors in all these different uh, chapters and sections. And we could do it on GitHub, of course. Uh, the first version of it was not done on GitHub. Well. It's there, but it's kind of not there. Uh, but now, if you have the, uh, the basic layout and the organization, now people could implement a, a scheme that works uh, similarly to any other project, which is a core team. Uh, maintainers, contributors can submit a pull request. Here's my update to the document. It can be reviewed put into the main body of the document and so on. So that's the vision that exists. Um, and as I mentioned, we uh, had um, in the first version really very limited content on 
uh, and touched on half a dozen of the areas that I mentioned. But again, I don't think that they went into much depth. So they were really not uh, all that satisfactory in terms of taking things away that you could use uh, for putting together the whole body of knowledge. So I think of the current uh, effort as a reboot. Okay. So we sort of know what we want to do. We've kind of laid out the, the space and the goals and the audience, the target market. Right. It's the same thing for any other product that you go out to build. What's the pain point? The pain point is trying to learn about uh, all the different areas of open source. What's the target market? We already talked about that. Uh, and then creating a uh, product vision and creating a roadmap. It's just like building any other product. So um, you know, part of it is getting the word out. So that's you know, what this is intended to, to start. Um, we're looking for sponsorship and financial support. Of course, that makes it possible to pay people uh, to, uh, to work on this, uh, even uh, in a limited way, and create a schedule and a roadmap and try to get something out this year. It's a little bit ambitious, but you know, if you focus on a couple of the areas, then you can use those to build toward, uh, toward longer. And of course, the uh, key question is, can you help? So um, this finds me. It's easy. Tony.wasserman at Gmail is one of my many, many email addresses. I've had email since 1974. So I have a Hotmail address and an AOL address and all of these other you know, legacy kinds of things. Uh, but uh, I think this one probably works as well as any. Uh, and um, that'll find me. Uh, one of the things that I started doing you know, 20 or so years ago, maybe even more, is I always end my presentations with a photo that I've taken. And it seems like the Vancouver skyline uh, is a, a good way to end. This is a picture I took, I don't know, five years ago, maybe. So there are more high rises now than there were then. But uh, they didn't leave much room on the, uh, for a beach. Right? It's high rises to the edge. In San Francisco, we don't have that. We have the piers. And you can walk all out the piers and all along the waterfront and the Embarcadero. Uh, and uh, the high rises are back a couple of blocks. All right. So let me stop there. And uh, thank you for coming, and thank you for your attention. Um, we have time for some questions, if there are any. Thank you. Yeah. All right. So um, I'm going to be around today. Uh, I have to go back tonight for family reasons. Uh, but um, if you uh, are interested, you know how to find me. and. Uh, you can catch me. Uh, I'm going to go to the OSPO reception at 6 o'clock, so I'll be around. OK? Thanks, all. <laughs>